In the name of Christ, the risen and ascended one, amen. You may be seated. If you could spend, if you could suspend the current pandemic for 24 hours and only for 24 hours, what would you do? How would you spend your time? Go ahead and think about it for a moment, but, but I bet you already have a pretty good idea of what you do. You see, I've asked this question all week long to a variety of different groups, and every time the responses were incredibly swift and remarkably similar. I go see my mom or my dad. I'd hug everybody. I would go meet my best friend's new firstborn baby. I just want to hang out with my grandkids and make up for all the missed hugs the past two months. You know, I just want to go to choir practice. I'd throw a dinner party for all of my friends. I'd just go for a walk with my friends. I'd like to have Eucharist with my church family. All week, whenever I've asked this question, almost every single response was so simple, pure even. And it almost always had something to do with reconnecting with our communities or our loved ones in person. No one, it seems, was longing for something complicated or over the top. No one wanted to squeeze in a madcap getaway to New York City or London, trying to outrun the hours in the day with activities. No one turned to world-saving attempts like canvassing and public demonstrations or political campaigning. With only a day to spare. You don't try to squeeze in a lifetime of stuff. Rather, you turn to the stuff that makes life worth living. Human touch. A shared meal. Community. And companionship. The quiet simplicity of our longings reminded me so much of how Jesus spent his last 50 days, those days between his resurrection and his ascension, and how he did so little of the work he'd done in the three years of his ministry. Gone were the sermons on the mounts and plains, the manifesting of feast for the masses and the vats of wine for inebriated wedding guests. Gone was the unhinging of demons from their tortured hosts, the extracting of illnesses and disease from skin and soul, the stuffing of life and spirit back into bodies gone slack with death. Gone were the masses marching towards Jerusalem and celebrating and cheering his entrance. Gone were the uncomfortable teachings that grated against custom and tradition and that tied leaders' stomachs into knots. Gone was the arguing of theology's grand minutia in the synagogue and the short and oblique parables that left everybody scratching their heads. All of it gone. And along with it, it seems this urgency of saving a broken world that we see throughout the Gospels. And why shouldn't it be gone? After all, it was finished. The victory over death had been won. All that was left was life. And so instead, in the resurrection, Jesus simply did a few small things, quietly, slowly, and with love. It's one of the most striking things about the season of Easter to me. After the breathless and breakneck drama of his ministry and his last week of life, the 50 days of Easter are like a deep and life-giving breath after a long day's dying. We only have a few sparse and strange stories about the resurrection, to be honest, but within them are some of the most curious and earthy details in all of the Gospels. Like how Jesus folded the sheet on his deathbed before leaving the tomb 
just like any considerate guest would do when leaving a room that didn't belong to them. How he spent that first early morning in a garden, maybe pulling weeds or just marveling at life and all its courses, until his dear friend Mary noticed him out in the dark and joined him. How he went on a walk with two of his friends far out of town with no end in sight. How he listened to his friend's grief. How he brought closure and reconciliation to a few whose mistakes and failures still weighed them down. How he gave them simple instructions for taking that next step out of the tunnel of trauma and self-recrimination to wait in Jerusalem, to feed his sheep. How he let people see and touch his wounds, perhaps an act more vulnerable and maybe even more powerful than other deeds he'd done. How he cooked a meal for his friends over a charcoal fire on a beach. How he ate bread and wine and honeycomb and, and broiled fish. How he ate and ate and ate and always with his friends. He even took bread and blessed it in thanksgiving, what we would call the Eucharist. Jesus did all the things we ourselves would do, are longing to do right now, if we were able to suspend this pandemic for a day. Human touch, shared meals with those we love, holy communion, and gentle, loving companionship with each other. Simple, little things that make for an abundant life. So often in our Christian faith, we find inspiration in people who did great and monumental things in our world. Those prophets and giants of the faith should occupy a central place in our tradition. Yet if I'm painfully honest with you this morning, especially during this extended time of separation, isolation, and being limited in what we're allowed to do, in which our formerly sprawling individual lives have collapsed into the four walls of our own homes, these exemplary saints haven't offered much consolation to me or even direction of, of how not just to cope with the current moment, but to continue on in the faith. And so I found myself turning to another part of the Christian tradition, those ancient monastics many of whom lived themselves in isolation and separation and who, in that context, often found a way to God in the smallest of tasks, the tiniest of things, much how Jesus lived in the resurrection. Take, for instance, St. David of Wales, whose last words to his monastics were not some complicated theological treatise or emotional goodbye, but a simple benediction to be joyful, keep the faith, do the little things. That's exactly where centuries later a monk named Brother Lawrence came to find his own deepest connection with God in the little things relegated primarily to kitchen duty and manual labor, Brother Lawrence found that he could practice the presence of God in all things. Instead of setting aside certain times and hours for dedicated prayer as was customary in monasteries, Brother Lawrence's spirituality transformed every moment into prayer and devotion to God. No matter what task was at hand, and he would say that he was as much at peace and at one with God in the busyness of a kitchen as he was kneeling before the consecrated bread and wine in worship. We can do little things for God, he explained. I turn the cake that is frying on the pan for the love of God. It is enough for me to pick up but a straw from the ground for the love of God. Now, saying that from the comfort of the pulpit is one thing. Remembering it day to day is quite another. 
especially when you're cleaning out the litter box or stripping hideous wallpaper from the bathroom or doing the dishes when you'd much rather be re-watching The Office on Netflix. But perhaps what these ancient Christians in their isolation can teach us today in our own is that part of what Jesus was revealing in the days between his resurrection and ascension was not just that he was resurrected, as extraordinary as that was and is, but how we might also share in his resurrection. Not at some point in the future, but right here and now. That the resurrection, the way of eternal life, reaches into the littlest parts of our earthly existence. That maybe he was still showing his disciples the way and the truth and the life. And what if God's way is as much about those simple little things as it is about the grand ones? You and I aren't going to find a cure for this virus that is ravaging the world right now. But we can wear our masks in public. We could wait to gather for a little bit longer. We can follow a few simple guidelines and practices to protect our communities and vulnerable neighbors. Little things. Perhaps we can't solve the economic crisis and the instant evaporation of millions of jobs, but, but we can check on our neighbors in need. We can spend a Tuesday morning helping out with the Church of the Advocate. We can buy a few extra things at the grocery store for the food bank. Little things. I know maybe a few extra canned goods aren't going to solve the world's economic problems right now or even our own communities. But perhaps enough little things from enough of God's people, enough of us, can make a big difference in our world. I can tell you that that has been so true in my own life, and very recently, too. You know, recently I received a pound of flour from someone here at Trinity as a, as a housewarming gift. And it wasn't just a pound of flour. It was a, a pound of chocolate and spaghetti sauce and noodles and, and even a pound of quarters. It was so much that it took two trips in my minivan from Trinity to get it all home. It was part of a traditional new house pounding organized by our rector, Scott, and carried out by so many in our parish. Each gift was this thoughtful gift of love. Individually, each pound of a gift was meant to be a little thing, though some were not very little, which I'm not complaining about. But taken together, pound after pound after pound after pound of pantry items from people in this parish became this astounding expression of collective generosity that truly overwhelmed my family with love. You see, little things matter. They matter perhaps because most of all they are so easy to overlook, but they make up our whole lives. So, my friends, let's do the little things. The little things of the resurrection. I know we can't do many of the things we're longing for right now, but we can still do so much. Send a letter to a friend. Bake a gift for someone you know is sad or grieving or depressed. Call your parents, your friends, your kids, your siblings. Just do the dishes when it's not your turn. And whatever little thing you find yourself doing this afternoon, do it as St. David of Wells would do. Do it as Brother Lawrence would do. Do it for the love of God. Because as Brother Lawrence reminds us, God regards not the greatness of the work, but the love of with which it is performed. Amen.